Welcome to the webcast. Uh, today we're going to be exploring collagen ORC, and we're going to be doing this in the context of restoring normal wound healing trajectories through complete protease management. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and is supported by an educational grant from Acelity. I am Dr. Robert Snyder, and uh, I will be the presenter for today. First and foremost, uh, my disclosure, I am a consultant for uh, Acelity. The faculty um, uh, myself uh, has disclosed that no off-label or unapproved uses of drugs and or devices will be discussed during this presentation. Um, so the learning objectives are pretty straightforward. We're going to first and foremost examine the clinical and scientific evidence behind collagen and oxidized regenerated cellulose dressings. Uh, we're going to discuss um, a good deal about the science and wound bed preparation. We're then going to tr transition to a review of case studies uh, utilizing collagen and oxidized regenerated cellulose uh, dressings throughout the clinical treatment pathway uh, for various wound types. So how significant is this problem? Well, this was a study done by David Armstrong in 2007, looking at the consequences of an unhealed neuropathic foot ulcer. And what he found was that a neuropathic foot ulcer from a mortality standpoint was actually more serious than some cancers like prostate cancer, breast cancer, and Hodgkin's disease. Well, how can this possibly be? Well, just think in terms of breast cancer as an example. I'm sure that everyone on this call has heard of the Susan B. Coleman Walk for the Cure. How many of you have heard about the Walk for the Neuropathic Foot Ulcer? Probably no one because uh, it's unlikely that this exists. So there is a lot of money really uh, being uh, utilized for the treatment of diabetes and uh, hopefully uh, have a cure at some point in time, but very little uh, um, dollars, unfortunately, are, are uh, utilized and spent on uh, discussing and uh, looking at therapies for neuropathic foot ulcers in patients with diabetes. So in looking at this study and this relative five-year mortality index, one can certainly make the initial uh, conclusion that it's the diabetes that's actually causing uh, death in these patients, not the neuropathic ulcer. And certainly that's a, that's a conclusion that I came to as well initially until I did some more research. I think this next study uh, may elucidate this further. This was a study done out of Norway on 63,000 patients. It was a very large population-based study which examined, examined uh, the association between foot ulcers in patients with diabetes and mortality risk, uh, looking at other disease factors as well. And what was found in this study, a very large study, is that in patients with diabetes, just having a neuropathic foot ulcer increased mortality rate by 47%. That's almost a 50% increase in mortality. So I think it's safe to say that just having a neuropathic foot ulcer is a marker for death. I wrote an article in 2010. I got a little flack for it because, again, the, the general perception at the time was that um, patients died because of the diabetic condition. This is a debilitating disease. It's a decaying disease, and certainly it made sense that this was the reason why patients died. But it wasn't until 2016 when David Margolis and colleagues uh, published an article in Diabetes Medicine that this was further elucidated. And what he said was that this could not be explained by any other common risk factor. So truly just having a neuropathic foot ulcer is a marker for death. So every day in the clinic when we work with these uh, sometimes seriously ill patients, um, we are dealing with life and death situations. So kind of digging deeper and getting a bit more granular, what is the problem? I'm sure you're all familiar with the normal wound healing cascade, starting with, uh, with hemostasis, moving through the inflammatory phase of wound healing, the uh, proliferative phase, and ultimately the reparative phase of wound healing. This is a very orderly, very well-timed event. 
Uh, and this is the reason why we can make incisions in people's bellies and in their legs and feet. And there's a predictable healing cascade which is occurring so that we feel comfortable removing sutures and staples from these individuals and that the wound will not just flop open. Even getting more granular, uh, certainly these are occurring in overlapping phases. And although they're occurring at different parts uh, at different times in the wound, they're occurring again in a very orderly, well-timed uh, event. Now, I kind of compare this model to looking at your television set or looking at your computer screen. The only time you really think about it is when it doesn't work. So that's really the difference between normal wound healing and abnormal wound healing that leads to stalled and chronic wounds. Now, when we're dealing with an acute wound scenario, we're dealing with a very, very nurturing environment. We're dealing with very robust cells that are turning over uh, very rapidly. Uh, we're looking at very low levels of proteases, very, very significant numbers of growth factors. You have receptor sites which are functioning properly, and you have low bacterial loads. Well, this is very different from the chronic wound scenario, which is clearly anything but nurturing. First and foremost, you have unresponsive or senescent cells. Senescent cells are not dead. They're just sleeping. They're sluggish. And if you do nothing to change this paradigm, you wind up with something called replicative senescence. So the wounds will heal, perhaps, but they'll heal very, very slowly and certainly may remain stalled or chronic. Non-migratory hyperproliferative wound edge, extraordinarily important. If you look at the center of this uh, photograph uh, and thinking of this in terms of real estate. Most people work in this real estate, which is the central portion of the wound, and, and in many cases ignore what's happening around the wound, that hyperproliferative wound edge. That hyperproliferative wound edge actually acts as a blockade so that um, keratinocytes in the peri wound cannot move across it. If they can't move across it, they will marginate around it. This leads to a concept called epiboly. Epiboly basically means that the wound edges roll over and seal off. So the body basically views the wound as healed. And certainly without addressing this hyperproliferative wound edge, in many cases by excising it or removing it, um, uh, you will not have appropriate wound healing. Chronic wounds have very high levels of proteolytic milieu. We'll talk a lot about proteases and wound healing and the fact that there are different types of proteases involved in not only acute wound healing, but chronic wound healing as well, and why perhaps these wounds will stall. Chronic wounds have deficient or unavailable growth factors. These important cytokines create chemotaxis and proliferation of the wound, and certainly if they're not present in sufficient amounts, this will not occur. Even if you did have sufficient growth factors at the wound site and you did not have well-functioning receptor sites around the cells, you would not have a firing of these physiologic responses, and therefore the wound would again cease to heal. And lastly, we have high levels of bacterial interference. Certainly every wound has some bacteria in it uh, based on the fact that uh, as soon as you have a breach in the epithelium, you have uh, contamination, you have colonization, and, 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 and so on. But as the wound certainly becomes more chronic, you have higher levels of bacterial interference, what we call increased wound bio-burden. And this not only will interfere with wound healing, but the bacteria itself will release its own enzymes, endotoxins and exotoxins, and will also inhibit wound healing. So if you think in terms of an acute wound as a nurturing environment, kind of sitting on the beach uh, somewhere and looking at the sun and drinking a pina colada, this particular model of a chronic wound is nothing more than a toxic waste dump. So, it's our goal to really change the paradigm and to uh, allow these wounds to go through a normal wound healing cascade. And even though this proposed mechanism of chronicity was based on the diabetic foot ulcer, this really is true of all chronic or stalled wounds. They all share a, a common biochemistry irrespective of the underlying etiology.
So I think you'll agree that we need a paradigm shift in the way we manage these wounds and the way we handle these protocols. And that really is part and parcel of understanding the wound microenvironment, because understanding this microenvironment certainly may lead to better choices, better treatment choices, and ultimately better outcomes. Now, looking in terms of dressings and therapies in general, there are many ways we can view this. One way, and, and very simplistically, <clears throat> is passive and active. So a passive dressing really is just a cover. It, it creates a barrier to allow exchange the gases of liquids and and uh, basically may absorb fluid, uh, but more often than not, it creates a moist healing environment. It does nothing more than that. It doesn't turn a light switch on. It doesn't create a physiologic response. The active wound dressing does something very, very different. It promotes a favorable wound microenvironment uh, in order to stimulate healing. It does this very often utilizing advanced techniques that are have been shown uh, uh, by evidence to be effective and effective therapies very, very often, and hopefully in many cases, will decrease the amount of time that it takes to heal these wounds. So certainly economically, uh, over the course of treatment, these patients will have um, less cost. Let's look at the evolution of wound therapies. I think you'll find this very interesting. In the 70s, we basically had passive dressings, traditional dressings, gauze, and sponges. But I think uh, you'll agree that we had gauze and sponges many, many years before. And in fact, we had them during the Revolutionary War. So they've been around a long, long time. Now, as we move into the 80s and we think about George Winter's work, <clears throat> uh, you can see that moist wound healing just exploded. You had hydropolymers, hydrocolloids, collagen dressing, gels, and of course, saline, wet to dry or wet to moist gauze. This was also used as a means of debridement. Now, as we move from the 90s uh, into the uh, 2000s and beyond, we began to see the proliferation of active healing, interactive therapies, <clears throat> things like growth factors, combinations of devices, negative pressure wound therapy, tissue engineered skin. So we really felt that looking at this continuum that we had a lot of the problem solved. But where are we actually in this paradigm? We're here. We're in the current standard of care dealing predominantly with symptoms. And in fact, more often than not, we're dealing with passive therapies. Again, what can be viewed as revolutionary war medicine. So let's think in terms of traditional therapy as standard of care. How effective is it? Well, this is a study done in 1999 by David Margolis. It was a meta-analysis. Uh, it's an older study. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for it because it's as relevant today, I believe, as it was when it was published. It's the only meta-analysis that I know of that looked at this particular dynamic. So what Dr. Margolis did was he basically looked at standard care in treating diabetic foot ulcers. He looked at offloading, debridement, and moist wound healing. And what he found was at 12 weeks, less than 25% of patients actually healed with standard care. At 20 weeks, about 31% of patients healed with standard care. Not very good at all. So even with good standard wound care, healing neuropathic ulcers in patients with diabetes continues to be a challenge. And certainly looking at this should be and should have been in 1999 a wake-up call that we very, very often need the utilization of advanced therapies. I think a big question is when should these advanced therapies be instituted? So in 2003, Peter Sheehan did some very interesting work looking at a surrogate endpoint of four weeks to determine whether or not a patient could heal by week 12. We repeated this study on a larger cohort of patients in 2010. What we found uh, in diabetic patients, wounds that did not reach a percent area reduction of at least 50% in the first four weeks only had a 2 to 5% chance of healing by week 12. So what does that mean? If you reverse those numbers, you can very easily see that 95
to 98% of wounds will not heal unless they reach that 50% threshold, percent error reduction, in the first four weeks. But this is not a positive predictor of healing. This is a negative predictor of healing. So we can determine if the wound doesn't reach a 50% threshold in four weeks that it's likely not going to heal. But even when it does reach a 50% threshold, about 50% of those patients won't heal at 12 weeks anyway. So my mentor and friend, uh, Dr. Robert Warner, looked at this and made two comments to me. Number one, he said, certainly this should give the clinician a sense of urgency to move forward uh, with advanced therapies early in the treatment regime. But he also proffered this. What about the next eight weeks? Could we find some surrogate endpoints that could help clinicians make decisions as to when advanced therapies may be appropriate? So we went ahead and we looked at that data again, and we looked at the next eight weeks. And what we found, indeed, were two additional endpoints. Ulcers that failed to progress or worsen from weeks four to six, and those that failed to achieve 90% error reduction by week eight would be unlikely to heal by week 12. So there is no excuse to kind of be scratching your head, particularly in the diabetic patient, and say, well, I have no idea when to use advanced therapies. I guess I'll use them when nothing else is working. I think the answer is very clear. You now have three validated endpoints, and I can tell you that this um, dynamic has been studied by others as well with similar results. Now, when you think in terms of uh, looking at treating these wounds and looking at algorithms that are out there, some of them are very complex. One algorithm that I really like to look at and, and, and teach about is the wound bed preparation model. This is a very simplistic but very powerful uh, algorithm that certainly can help um, clinicians heal their patients in a more expeditious manner. It's a holistic approach to treating these wounds. First and foremost, we're looking to see if a wound is even healable, because a wound that's healable will certainly be treated with much more aggressive therapeutic regimes than wounds that are palliative or patients that have less than six months to live, et cetera. So certainly, first and foremost, is the wound even healable? Secondly, we have to identify and treat the cause. Just because something looks like a wound, like a diabetic foot ulcer, doesn't mean it's not a squamous cell cancer. So you have to make a determination very early on as to what it is you're treating before you can even provide local wound care. We have to address patient-centered concerns. We're not just treating a whole, we're treating a whole patient. So what's the patient's blood sugar? What's their lipid profile? Are they compliant? What's their psychological uh, uh, um, uh, mentality, what, what, are they, what are they thinking, are they depressed, etc. Uh, working in conjunction with the patient's primary care doctor certainly will be critical in this regard. And once all of this is done, then you can begin looking very carefully at the wound and one very easy acronym that you can use to remember how to proceed is DIME, D-I-M-E, debridement, control of infection, inflammation, moisture balance or imbalance, and wound edge preparation. Remember, we discussed in some detail the importance of that wound edge. If you don't remove that hyperproliferative wound edge and actually change the geometry of the wound, those keratinocytes will not move across the wound and epithelialization will not occur. So again, a very simplistic but very powerful tool. So wound bed preparation really is a very important step, not only in diagnosing and treating wounds, but also protecting against wound infection. So let's turn our attention to proteases and why they're important in wound healing. Let me preface what I'm going to tell you by saying that the average clinician looks at proteases and says, oh my God, proteases are all bad. We have to get rid of all of them. They're just uh, precluding wound healing each and every time. Well, I can tell you that proteases are very important in wound healing when we see them in low levels. There are two types of uh, categories of proteases, uh, MMPs or matrix metalloprotease, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But there's another group you may not be familiar with, and that's the serine elastase or human neutrophil elastase. Remember, um, chronic wounds are stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing. And during that phase, the most predominant cell is the neutrophil. 
the neutrophil will pour out neutrophil elastase. So certainly it is very important to deal with the MMPs, but you also must deal with the human neutrophil elastase as well. Now, thinking in broad strokes, um, uh, these uh, MMPs and serine elastase uh, function optimally under physiologic conditions. And in fact, they're synthesized and stored in, in an inactive uh, proenzyme until they're really uh, need it. So what tends to happen is um, they're almost imperceptible unless you have some type of injury or some type of breach in the epithelium. They're normally controlled at the tissue level by natural inhibitors such as TIMPS, tissue inhibitors of metalloprotease. But one thing to keep in mind is collectively left unchecked, they can degrade the entire extracellular matrix. Now why is this important? The extracellular matrix is the largest structure of the skin. It's almost gelatinous in nature, and it has collagen, elastin, fibronectin, and glycaminoglycans. Very, very important. And we've known for years that the extracellular matrix was kind of the infrastructure, the architecture to hold cells in place. We now know through very, very significant work by Greg Schultz and colleagues that something else is afoot when we're really looking at this dynamic. Not only are you having an architecture for the extracellular matrix, but the extracellular matrix is actually communicating with other cells in the womb, like endothelial cells, fibroblasts. If that extracellular matrix is destroyed or not replaced, that communication is disconnected and wound healing will not occur. So proteases, again, in low levels are extremely important. They're important because they, they're involved in the formation and the degradation of a fibrin clot. They clean away bacteria. They create uh, a focus for migration of inflammatory cells. They stimulate fibroblast activity, select a growth factor, act, growth factor activation, and they also debride the uh, extracellular matrix fragments that are present uh, in the wound as the wound is kind of being cleaned up. Also importantly, it creates cell migration of keratinocytes, and this will allow for epithelial globalization. So again, in low levels, these proteases are extraordinarily important for wound healing. But what happens when proteases are seen in excessive amounts? Well, things go awry, and the, and the proteases we have to be most concerned with are matrix metalloproteases 2, 8, and 9, and also serine elastase, or um, human neutrophil elastase. The MMPs that we're most concerned about, 2, 8, and 9, uh, 2 and 9 are very similar, 8 is a bit different. But nonetheless, these are the enzymes that are, can be most detrimental at high levels. This was a study done by Tom Serena, uh, and, and if you look at this uh, carefully, the, the kind of blue area is um, normal wound healing, and the gray area is uh, abnormal uh, wound healing or wounds that fail to respond. So what is actually going on here? Well, Serena did some very, very interesting work, and he found several things. Number one, something that we already knew, as protease activity increases, the probability of healing decreases unless you use some type of appropriate intervention. But what I found to be even more intriguing is that if proteases were not addressed in the wound, only 10% of those wounds would heal. So again, extremely important to address elevated protease activity. So how are proteases dealt with in today's practice? Well, one very important way is utilization of collagen ORC. Collagen ORC is basically a combination of 55% collagen and 45% oxidized regenerated cellulose. It is a bioresorbable uh, uh, dressing. Uh, it basically disappears for all intents and purposes over uh, two to three days. It's amorphous. It has an open pore matrix and very, very important dressing. Now, when you look in terms of collagen and ORC, let's break down the two components so that we can really understand the importance of this dressing. So the benefits of collagen have been clear for years. First and foremost, it's a hemostat and enhances the deposition of new collagen fibers while it's reducing wound contraction. Uh, it's bioresorbable. Collagen proteins and peptides will stimulate cells, so you get chemotaxis and proliferation of cells like neutrophils and macrophages and fibroblasts. But what I really want you to focus in on is this. 
Collagen acts as a sacrificial substrate for excessive matrix metalloproteases. And what does that mean? Well, rather than the MMPs gnawing away at the wound, they gnaw away at the collagen. So rather than destroying the extracellular matrix in the wound, they are basically destroying that collagen dressing. So very, very important and very beneficial for wound healing. What about oxidized regenerated cellulose? Cellulose is the most abundant biomass on the face of the earth, also bioresorbable. It's a very, very strong hemostat. ORC actually lowers the pH, it breaks down into glucose and glucuronic acid. So it basically helps control, by lowering the pH, it helps control bacterial growth. Studies in vitro have shown that ORC collagen actually stimulates cell proliferation and growth factor protection. But what's really important for our purposes today is that ORC inactivates proteases such as elastase. Remember, there are two sides to this equation. There are the MMPs and there's a the serine elastase. Both of them must be addressed in order to get an appropriate outcome. So when you think in terms of collagen ORC, this is a, certainly a, a very novel therapy. It can be used in all kinds of wounds, as you can see from this slide. But how does it really work? Well, uh, basically when you put it on a wound, it sucks up everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You have matrix metalloproteases, and, and uh, they are basically uh, gnawing on the collagen, but they're also inactivated by the ORC component. You now have growth factors which are sequestered in the dressing, so they're kind of protected from the growth factors. Now you start to have a degradation of the product becomes bioresorbed. And as these byproducts and as the enzymes and as the growth factors go back into the wound, the enzymes go back in an inactive form, but the growth factors go back in an active form. And this is extremely important because those growth factors can now continue to work by stimulating chemotaxis and proliferation. You also have a dressing which will absorb free radicals. So how do they pick 55% and 45%? They did a whole lot of in vitro studies here, uh, looking at 0 and 100, all the way up to 100% collagen and no ORC at all. And what they found at 55%, 45%, you had collagen ORC reducing serine elastase by 100%. Now, if you looked at collagen alone, it was only a 30% reduction in elastase. Again, when those wounds are stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing, those neutrophils are pouring out human neutrophil elastase. That has to be stopped. And the ORC collagen at 55 45% will do that. Same thing is really true of MMPs uh, when utilized with, ORC, with collagen ORC. Uh, this is a significant reduction of both MMP8 and MMP9. Remember, 2 and 9 are very similar. 8 is a bit different. But again, compared to the control, you had a marked decrease in enzyme activity over a period of 24 hours. This was another interesting study. Uh, basically, it was an in vitro model uh, done on chronic wound fluid. And what they did was they took chronic wound fluid and they put platelet-derived growth factor in the chronic wound fluid. Platelet-derived growth factor, as you know, is, uh, is utilized in all phases of wound healing. So when they put it in contact with the chronic wound fluid, it almost immediately disappeared. It just ate up the platelet-derived growth factor. When you put it in contact with gauze, not much else happened. But look what occurred when you had platelet-derived growth factor in conjunction with collagen ORC. You had almost as much PDGF as you did when you started because it created a protective effect. What's even more important is as the product began to degrade over 96 hours, 81% of PDGF was recovered. So that 81% was protected against those noxious proteases that would have un unfortunately been detrimental if it were not for the collagen ORC. So I hope you're beginning to understand the importance of the combination of the collagen and the oxidized regenerated cellulose. Now, I think we all understand uh, the, the, this whole concept, but what about uh, if an individual has a wound – 
presents with a wound that has what we call friable granulation tissue. In other words, has high levels of bacteria, high bacterial bio burden, not quite infection, uh, perhaps uh, high levels of colonization, maybe a cult infection, uh, uh, but you need to do something to lower the bacterial burden. You don't necessarily have to use a cannon to do that. So in this particular case, you can use collagen ORC with a sliver 1% of silver. So this is 55% collagen, 44% oxidizer generated cellulose, and 0.25% or 1% silver salt of oxidized regenerated cellulose. And it's an ionic form, and that's extremely important because ionic silver is the only mm -hmm. silver that is actually bactericidal. So why are we using silver at all? Well, silver eradicates bacteria in the dressing. The ORC silver salt releases ionic silver at the wound surface. Silver certainly has a very, very strong bactericidal effect. Uh, it is, it is uh, very, very difficult to develop resistance to silver, so you can, you can use it uh, as needed. It has benefit against 150 plus strains of bacteria, yeast, and molds commonly found in all kinds of chronic wounds. But, but even, even more significantly, I think in this day and age, now that we know that 60 to 90% of all stalled or chronic wounds have some kind of biofilm activity, we're beginning to realize that silver may also have an effect on biofilm in vitro. Remember, biofilm are these virulent bacteria which are in this glycocalyx, this tube, and also the metabolic rate of the, uh, the bacteria are very, very slow. So systemic antibiotics really are not normally beneficial against it. So utilization of silver may certainly have a positive effect. So we talk about a low level of silver. What is this really doing? Well, when we think in terms of how we measure kill rates or effectiveness against pathogens and resistant strains, we look in terms of log reduction, in this case a five log reduction. Look at what happened over a very short time frame with some significant organisms like MRSA, VRE, and strep. So you can see even at a low level of silver, three parts per million, you have a significant effect on resistant bacterial, bacterial strain and wound pathogens. One thing to keep in mind is that early adoption significantly improves the outcome. So I just published a study along with uh, Brita Cullen, Tom Serena and colleagues, Jason Haft was also involved in this as well. And we did a randomized control study uh, comparing collagen and oxidized regenerated cellulose and silver compared to standard care, which was adaptic in this case, and compression in the management of venous leg ulcers. And what we found was, I think, very significant. At four weeks, we had twice the amount of healing of wounds than we did in the control group. Why is this important? Because we find that in the first four weeks, particularly in a virgin wound scenario, you find that there are great, the greatest levels of bacterial bio burden the greatest levels of enzyme activity. So by decreasing uh, these enzymes and by decreasing the bacterial load, uh, healing was very significant, and again, statistically significant. We also saw it again in some form at about 12 weeks. But the thing that really rings true here is that if you're using these therapies early, you're most likely going to get a better result. Now, when you think in terms of systemic antibiotics, there seems to be some controversy that you don't really need topical agents. You know, systemic agents are enough. Well, there was some pivotal research done. It was done uh, in 1997 by Marty Robeson and colleagues. I mean, a long time ago, but still as relevant today, and in fact, even more relevant in my, in my view than it was in 1997. And the pivotal research showed that systemic antibiotics really failed to reach adequate tissue levels in chronic granulation tissue because the granulation tissue is, for all intents and purposes, ischemic. So certainly this could have limited value in reestablishing any bacterial balance at the wound surface. 
So it fosters the idea, it proffers the idea that antimicrobials and antiseptics can be used and should be used with systemic therapies where appropriate. And this is particularly germane today in today's day and age when we're thinking in terms of biofilm because planktonic bacteria will seed to form biofilm. If you decrease the planktonic bacteria at the wound surface, you will very likely decrease biofilm as well. Let's look at some of the clinical evidence uh, surrounding collagen ORC and collagen ORC with silver. Level one evidence, there were 682 patients in 10 clinical trials, of level one evidence, whole host of other studies, cohort studies, case series, editorials, et cetera. Focus in for a moment, if you will, uh, on the level three evidence, uh, greater than 50 posters and papers uh, done on laboratory studies involving chronic wound fluid and proteases. Um, there is a, a very, very important laboratory in Gargrave, UK, that has just rooms full of uh, chronic wound fluid that has been utilized through the years to study proteases and the utilization of various dressings to combat them at high levels. So that's why you have such a, a large, robust number of um, laboratory studies. So 10 published studies, 682 patients. Let's focus in, uh, if we will, on the 40-patient study of Finn Gottrib uh, uh, utilizing uh, collagen ORC and silver on diabetic patients. What he did, and I was glad to see this, he used the uh, greater than 50% uh, wound area reduction at four weeks to determine whether or not these wounds were responders or non-responders when it came to the collagen ORC silver versus the moist wound healing control. And clearly, uh, there was statistical significance uh, looking at the benefit of collagen ORC and silver versus the control uh, relative to the response rate at four weeks. But just as significant, the healing rate at 14 weeks in the collagen ORC silver group was 91% healed or improved versus 69% healed or improved. Now, this is incredibly important research, but the next slide, I think, as a researcher was probably as important as these other data points. When diabetic patients are put in clinical trials, very, very often they wash out of those trials because they get infected. No other reason but the fact that they're diabetic and they have problems and poor protoplasm and vascular issues, et cetera. In this particular study that Dr. Gottrib did, zero patients were withdrawn for infections, 33% in the control group. So again, to me as a researcher, very significant data. Now, when we talked about Tom Serena's work um, we said that if the proteases were not addressed, that only 10% of wounds would heal. Well, here's an example of an ex vivo study showing the effectiveness in venous leg ulcers. This patient had a wound for seven and a half years. All kinds of therapies, including compression, etc. Nothing worked until collagen ORC treatment was instituted. And over a period of six weeks, the wound went on to completely heal. The reason is when they looked at the ex vivo model, in other words, taking samples of the wound, bringing them to the laboratory and looking at these markers, they found that there was a dramatic decrease in MMPs and elastase. And this was the reason why the wound finally went on to heal after seven and a half years. Now, what about cost? There seems to be kind of misperception as to the fact that, you know, if a dressing costs $5 versus $8, that that's going to make a significant difference at the end of the day. Well, research clearly shows that the material costs actually equal about 15 to 20% of this equation. Nursing time actually factors in at between 30 and 35%. Carolyn Fife and Marcia Nussgaard and colleagues just published a very significant paper looking at the numbers of patients that were seen outpatient, and the numbers were just very, very significant. So the vast number of patients that we do see are seen in an ambulatory setting, in an outpatient setting. Of course, when the patient is brought into the hospital, all bets are off. The costs go through the roof. But 
those costs that are incurred when the patient is outside of the walls of the hospital become very, very significant. So that being said, I had written a paper with two colleagues, uh, and it was a retrospective study of sequential therapy with advanced wound care products. This was uh, ORC collagen and ORC collagen with silver versus saline gauze. And I wanted to compare the healing rates and the cost. Now, I was criticized initially because I used saline. Well, saline is not the standard of care. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, in the United States at least, many, many individuals still use saline gauze as a mainstay of therapy. So I wanted to use real-world data. Look at the results. This, this is kind of the statistical pool on your left here. But if we looked at this over a period of two months. And what we found in the saline gauze group, that only 7.2% of those wounds healed at a cost of over $7,300. The sequential therapy group with ORC collagen and ORC collagen with silver showed a 95% healing rate at a cost of about $2,100. Where was that cost? The nursing care. So if you can increase the amount of time that addressing can be left in place and addressing is effective, then you decrease nursing costs, you increase healing rates, and you decrease overall costs. So here's the case study. Here's a 67-year-old man with insulin-dependent diabetes. He had a history of a blood posterior tibial artery, which had recently been opened with an angioplasty. Unfortunately, even though he had diabetes for 30 years and should have known better, he burned his foot on a heating pad. His foot hurt, and he thought the heat would help him. So that he had severe neuropathy, and he presented to the office with an infection in some necrotic areas, and this is what it looked like. So um, he was hospitalized, and of course you see these necrotic plaques. We elected not to take the patient in the operating room, uh, um, immediately. Uh, we felt that we should initially treat him with antibiotics, uh, treat the wounds topically until we started to see exfoliation of those necrotic plaques. And, and over a reasonably short period of time, the necrotic patch started to exfoliate, and we began using collagen ORC with silver. And this was used for a period of several weeks. During that period, we ultimately took the patient to the operating room and did a debridement continued uh, with the collagen, ORC, and silver. We then instituted negative pressure wound therapy and ultimately applied a split thickness skin graft to two of the wounds, and they went on to heal. Now, in this particular case, it was appropriate to use split thickness skin because the patient had an apropulsive gait. He didn't walk heel to toe, so the skin grafts uh, were a very, very good option, and the patient went on to do extremely well. Here's another case study, uh, necrosis in a patient with diabetes secondary to trauma. This was a 54-year-old black male with insulin-dependent diabetes. He presented to our office with this very foul-smelling liquefactive necrosis. Uh, he stated that it occurred after a very insidious injury when he hit his, his foot on a car door. He said the symptoms were present for five days, but really wasn't sure. The area was so foul-smelling that, unfortunately, the, the office was completely permeated even from the waiting room. That's how bad it was. And he had frank purulence and pain. The foot was swollen. It was very painful, despite the fact that he had diabetic neuropathy. And, and the patient was urgently admitted to the hospital. The patient did have uh, endovascular intervention, but he did require extensive debridement on an emergent basis. Uh, he had tremendous copious drainage and unfortunately had a history of noncompliance. We wanted to use negative pressure wound therapy initially, but we were concerned because of the patient's noncompliance and the fact that we thought that he would just shear anything that we put on his foot away. So in this case, we used something which I thought was pretty creative. We used an external fixator, uh, this kind of circular frame, and it had a, a foot plate on it. So we could use this for offloading, and we began our negative pressure wound therapy. The negative pressure wound therapy was used with a, silic with a silicone dressing as an interface between the negative pressure 
and the wound itself. Now, some clinicians will use this, uh, others will not. Uh, I like to use it because it prevents, in my view, the ingrowth of granulation tissue into the foam and is uh, easy to remove and is pain-free. The patient did have some setbacks. He developed a pocket. We needed some additional debridement. We used the dermal skin equivalent to eventually continue with negative pressure wound therapy. Now, the negative pressure wound therapy and the frame was subsequently discontinued, but the wound was still open. So in this case, we decided to use collagen ORC. The wound was still stalled, still what we felt was in a chronic state, but we used it in conjunction and synergetically with the total contact gas. And the wound went on to heal without incident. This is a very sad case. This is a necrosis secondary to infection. Uh, along with compartment syndrome. Remember, when patients fill up those compartments, those deep compartments with pus, you can get the same dynamic as you would if you had a compartment syndrome. This is a, a very pleasant 67-year-old white male who was recipient of a kidney and pancreatic transplant. He was a very, very busy man, uh, uh, traveled all over the world, uh, lecturing to various uh, business groups, uh, et cetera. Uh, so he was on the road a great deal. Uh, he originally had a history of a small ulceration under the first metatarsal head. We were concerned, but he, he did decide to go on his trip. And after walking around extensively and sitting in planes for long periods of time, he developed this very, very serious um, wound with necrosis. The area was extraordinarily painful despite diabetic neuropathy. Uh, fortunately, he had a history of a recent distal bypass that was still patent, but certainly the surgery was considered emergent. The patient was immediately taken to the operating room. We did an open transmetatarsal amputation, applied cadaveric allograft that was fenestrated. We utilized negative pressure wound therapy for two weeks. An angiogram showed that three vessel runoff was still there so that the patient we felt had adequate vascularity to support wound healing. And the patient fortunately did go on to heal this open transmetatarsal amputation. And I'll show you that slide. But unfortunately, he went on another trip. This was the second event. The patient's transmetatarsal amputation healed, but subsequently when he returned from his additional trip, he had severe necrosis and infection, secondary to lack of adherence and a tight shoe. And again, needed emergency surgery to remove all necrotic areas. <clears throat> So here on the left is, uh, is an example of uh, what the wound looked like after extensive debridement. We then applied an acellular human durable matrix. We fenestrated it so that we could continue with negative pressure wound therapy. Two weeks after the acellular dermal matrix was applied and negative pressure, silicone dressing, we made the decision that we were going to use a split thickness skin graft. And this was performed and negative pressure was continued for five additional days. The patient ultimately went on to heal. But what I want you to take note of in the lower left-hand corner is the donor site. The donor site very typically is treated with a bismuth dressing, with a zero form. Bismuth dressings are drying agents. So it's almost counterintuitive to use zero form on any wound like this. But we have found through the years, and, and I learned this from my plastic surgery colleagues early on, that this was a very effective dressing. We would kind of wait for it to kind of dry up and curl up and then fall off by itself. And diabetic patients particularly would, would, would always come in and say, you know, where you put the graft doesn't hurt, but where you took the graft does hurt. So we may have a solution for that now, and that's the utilization of collagen ORC, or collagen ORC with silver. Now, I just finished telling you for several slides that this particular therapy is utilized for chronic wounds, but we're now telling you to use it for acute wounds. Well, why? Well, let's break down the dressing into its component parts. You have collagen, certainly, which will augment healing. It's a hemostatic agent. You have ORC, which is not only a hemostat, but is also lowering wound bio-burden because it's lowering the pH. Plus, this dressing will evaporate. 
And as the dressing is bioresorbed, you don't have to remove it. Very, very often what will occur is when you remove that dressing, which is usually a foam dressing that we put over that in the first week, that um, donor site is very, very often completely re-epithelialized. We're also finding that this can be very, very useful in treating skin tears as well. So how do we put this all together? Well, I wrote an article uh, with Carolyn Fife and Zena Moore, um, two very prominent individuals, uh, and we looked at the components of the DIME paradigm in conjunction with quality measures. Quality measures, after all, is how we're going to be judged and ultimately how we're going to be paid and compensated. So we tried to kind of tie together the DIME algorithm and how we could use this uh, to incorporate quality measures. Again, looking at this wound bed preparation model, extraordinarily important. Again, very simplistic, but very powerful. Wound bed preparation is a very important step, not only for diagnosing and treating, but also protecting against wound infection. So when you look at the keys to success, right in the center of this equation is education. Educating the doctor, the clinician, educating the patient, educating the caregiver, educating the generalist. The utilization of electronic medical records right now has become draconian for many of us. <clears throat> but in the future, hopefully this will allow us to communicate with a whole array of professionals in various locations. So we will be able to communicate better. Using evidence-based protocols is critical, and I've just shown you many examples of how ORC collagen and ORC collagen with silver has evidence. Economic feasibility. We have to use these therapies in a multidisciplinary approach, and we should consider using them in either a multi-step, sequential, or synergetic process. Now, again, my mentor, Dr. Warner, uh, used to uh, tell me this all the time, and it's something that I've lived by. If you have no improvement within the first four weeks, start over. It's likely you've missed something. We all miss things. So it's very, very important that you take a blank sheet of paper and you start from the beginning. So in summary, looking at ORC collagen and ORC collagen silver, these certainly are unique dressings that have a significant amount of evidence. They're clinically different because collagen acts as this sacrificial substrate against excessive MMPs, and the ORC inactivates the proteases, such as serine elastase. But the ORC also lowers the pH as it breaks down. Remember, it breaks down to glucose and glucuronic acid. So by lowering the pH, it helps control bacterial growth. Now, ORC collagen with silver contains a very low level of ionic silver, three parts per million, but it still has a significant log reduction, and it does not do it at the expense of host cells. In fact, it does not harm host cells. There's no evidence that shows that fibroblasts or any other cells are negatively affected at this low level of silver concentration. So I'll leave you with this. If the only wound treatment you have is a hammer, then every wound healing problem will be a nail. I guess the point of this is that not every wound responds to, every th to each therapy every single time. Every patient is different. Every wound is different. So your toolbox or armamentarian of therapy has to be very, very significant, very broad, very wide, and, and often very focused. So I leave you with this, and thank you very, very much uh, for allowing me uh, time today. Uh, and this will um, end and conclude uh, my presentation.